we're thrilled that you are here to join us for yet another incredible presentation. Again, as I say, our presentations are not incredible because of anything from and in and of ourselves, but from the fact that we are examining sacred scripture, the Bible of the early church, of the apostolic church. And I am thrilled to be here with you today because today we're going to be talking about the complete book of Esther. Now, you may be wondering, what are you talking about the complete book of Esther? Well, it is only within the deuterocanonical version of Esther that you actually have God that is present right there in the text. In the Protestant version of Esther, it is a godless Esther, which is a bit of a shocking kind of um, truth that must be examined today. And today we're going to indeed examine how uh, early ancient apostolic Christianity utilized Deuteroesther, and how even early ancient Judaism utilized Deuteroesther. This will be a brief examination. It will not be one or two or three hours. Indeed, we could go very long, but we believe these shorter videos seem to be much more edifying for you. And we hope that this presentation, which will aim to go very in-depth on the material, we really do hope that you'll be edified for it, because ultimately our goal here at the Apocrypha Apocalypse is to crush any kind of idea that these deuterocanonical texts don't belong in the Bible. That's why we call it the Apocrypha Apocalypse. It is a kind of destruction of the idea that the apostolic Bible has additions to it that were added later were never utilized by the apostolic church. Indeed, these additions to the book of Esther have always been considered part of the apostolic Bible, the Bible of the early church. I cannot wait to dig in with you. God bless you. It has always been a, a conundrum, if you will, a bit of an embarrassment, if you will, where you find the very common argument within Protestantism that their canon of Scripture is self-attesting. Now, what does that mean? Of course, very similar to the feeling of the burning in the bosom kind of um, argumentation for how one can know a given book is sacred Scripture. Really a very bad criteria if you ask anyone that is uh, well acquainted with the early church and and um, how it took time to hammer down those books that were recognized as apostolic, those that were utilized in all of the apostolic churches. Uh, because if one were to say, well, you know what, I know this book is in, belongs in my Bible because it's very clearly inspired and it screams inspiration off the pages of the text. Well, how does a Protestant come to that conclusion in their Book of Esther, which is clearly missing those very important portions that do contain mention of God? God is absent in the Protestant version of the Book of Esther. Now, one may say, well, he's very clearly working in the background of the Book of Esther, and we do not deny that, because we believe that the proto-canonical portions of the text are definitely inspired and God is definitely present everywhere. But we believe that in order for the full picture to come forth of this holy book of scripture, you've got to have the complete book of Esther. And the absence of God being mentioned in the Protestant book, book of Esther is a glaring problem. There is a reason why the Deuterocanonical Book of Esther, the longer edition of Esther, was the one that was canonized, was utilized by all of the early church councils, and was the one that was considered sacred scripture. It's a very clear reason why. We will see exactly how this becomes a bit of an embarrassment for Protestantism. Indeed, this is a legacy that is an unfortunate one that Protestants have got to carry with them. Here we see, and we are using uh, that great online resource of Bible Gateway, where we can check out the new revised standard version, updated edition, looking at chapter 10 of the book of Esther. And we realize that it, it abruptly ends. It, it has an abrupt ending right there. For Mordecai the Jew was next in rank to King 
Ahasuerus. And he was powerful among the Jews and popular with its many kindred. For he sought the good of his people and interceded for the welfare of all his descendants. You can scour the full book of Esther, every single chapter of the Protestant version, and you will not ever encounter God ever being mentioned. This is a problem that even Protestant scholars recognize, and it's uh, a problem that has been exploited for a very long time by a liberal scholarship to note that Protestantism has a major problem, aside from the very fact that Protestantism embarrassingly lacks those seven books and much and more that were originally part of the canon of scripture, which is an embarrassing part of history that they adopted well after Luther, is something of a legacy that they carry with them today. And it is one also where they embarrassingly have an incomplete book of Esther. We recognize the Greek editions were later editions, but they were deemed canonical by the apostolic church. That is first and foremost, if you had scripture decided, when the church gathered in council after council after council, the deuterocanonical version of Esther was always present. That is number one that we've got to double down on and realize, which is quite problematic for modern day Protestantism. The book of Esther ends right here. It ends right there. That is, this is, this is a Protestant version, the NRSV. Not the Catholic edition, the Protestant version. What about a Catholic edition? What, what do you find in a Catholic edition? Do you find anything anything different? Well, if you hop on over to the Dewey Reams or any other Catholic edition, 1899 American edition, the Dewey Reams. Let's hop on. Actually, let's let's expand it to chapter 10, all of chapter 10. And it doesn't just end right there. Mordecai, there's more. Look at verse 4. Then Mordecai said, God hath done these things. I remember a dream that I saw, which signified these same things, and nothing there thereof hath failed. You will notice that over and over, you're going to find God mentioned in the Deuterocanonical version, which we would argue is the complete version of the book of Esther. And that's perhaps the main point that we must emphasize that the longer edition of Esther is the one that the apostolic churches decided belonged in the Bible. So our Catholic Bibles have 10 additional verses that you can find in chapter 10, and they have chapters 11 through 16. And you can find God mentioned. By the way, you can do a search here. <clears throat> look up here, look here online and just put, uh, put God. You're going to find that God appears 24 times, and Lord, 23. This is in the Deuterocanonical edition of Esther. It does not appear in the Protestant version, in the Protestant version. So the argument you hear very often that, well, we know it's scripture because it screams inspiration off the pages, off the text, is absolutely incorrect. It is an argument that we uh find a number of problems for because indeed there are many great writings what about the book of enoch what about early in the early church some of these epistles like the epistle of pope saint clement of rome that were viewed as incredibly edifying do we then say that because they are incredibly edifying and they sound inspired that they belong in the canon of scripture of course not it's much more complex than that and that is why we must yield to that magnificent authority of the apostolic church that Christ founded. And when we do that, we find that the longer deuterocanonical version of Esther indeed does have mention of God, doesn't have that glaring, embarrassing absence that is very present, an absence that is very present within the Protestant text. And so we encounter a major issue, that issue being that there is no evidence of an early Protestant canon in the early church. It just didn't exist. It just didn't exist. The canon of Protestantism just did not exist in the early church. And you can't even hearken to the figure of Josephus 
to back you up. By the way, Josephus and his canon don't resemble that of Protestantism. Don't resemble that of Protestantism. He indicates that uh, he, um, in words that he says, he indicates he's sticking to what he believes to be sacred uh, scripture alone. And he includes Maccabees and Deuterocanonical Esther there. So there's a problem with uh, Protestantism when uh, when the desire, and this is a major problem, and that problem is when the desire is to try to present evidence that really simply is not there to then claim that your version of Scripture is that which can be found in antiquity. Josephus is an example of this simply not working. Because towards the end of his Antiquities of the Jews, Josephus notes that he is stuck to utilizing the sacred writings. Interestingly enough, he quotes from one Maccabees and quotes from Deuteroester. So an early Jewish historian in Josephus is evidence that if you want to claim that the canon of Scripture was closed at the time, by the time of Christ, and it was a Protestant version of Scripture— and Judaism accepted that, you've got a major problem because you're early, the earliest Jewish historian that gives us evidence of utilization of these texts shows that Deuteroester was being utilized as scripture, including one Maccabee. So you've got a major problem. That problem being that we believe that God is the author of canon. We believe that, of course, but the fact that your canon is not present in antiquity is a glaring problem, and it is very glaringly problematic that the Protestant version of Esther is lacking mention of God. We have to emphasize this point over and over, as tough as it may be. We love our evangelical friends. We love our Protestant brothers um, and sisters, our separated brothers and sisters, but we call them to the fullness of the faith that can only be found in the Catholic Church. The fullness of the faith. We call them to that. Pope St. Clement of Rome. The blessed Judith, he says in his uh, letter to the Corinthian church, when her city was besieged, asked of the elders permission to go forth into the camp of the strangers. And exposing herself to danger, she went out for the love which she bore to her country and people then besieged. And the Lord delivered Holofernes into the hands of a woman, Esther also, being perfect in faith, and exposed herself to no less danger in order to deliver the 12 tribes of Israel from impending doom, destruction. So this is very clear that, uh, speaking of people that are perfect in faith, being uh, delivered, of course, by God, he's very clearly referring to the Deutero Esther as well. This is an apostolic church father in Pope St. Clement of Rome likely wrote before the second century very likely the late uh some scholars say 80s or 90s i have seen earlier dating we'll go with a uh around 80 or 90 ish for now it is noted in a popular survey of the old testament that it has always been a bit embarrassing to the claim of divine inspiration for the book of esther to acknowledge that a book god inspired does not have the name of God in it. This is quite powerful. This is a point that we have been emphasizing over and over here. The point being that the Deuterocanonical book of Esther is indeed the book of Esther that we should all be reading. Very interestingly enough, uh, we find the fact that Luther did not remove the Deuterocanonical Book of Esther, but showed clear reservations. There is no God, there is the absence of prayer, and there is the absence of true miracles. So if you look at the Hebrew text, you will not be surprised that this is lacking because it is also lacking in the Protestant version. Well, when we say Protestant, we mean the Hebrew text that it is adopted. But the first Christians utilized this book in his work called the rest of the Bible, Theron Mathis mentions that multiple fathers utilized this book, utilized the Deuterocanonical book of Esther. In there, he lists 
uh, Pope St. Clement of Rome, the great Ambrose of Milan, and Afrahat the Persian, as well as the great St. Athanasius of Alexandria. Even Jerome, he notes, utilized this. They saw the important characters of Esther and Mordecai as very typical types of the church and of Christ. They were reading the deuterocanonical version of Esther. This is important because the deuterocanonical one does have the prayer. It has Mordecai's prayer. When Mordecai hears that Haman has a plot to murder the Jews, there is a magnificent prayer that appears that is not present in the Protestant version of Esther. O Lord, Lord, King who rulest over all things, for the universe is in thy power and there is no one who can oppose you if it is your will to save Israel. But you hast made heaven and earth and every wonderful thing under heaven, and you are Lord of all, and there is no one who can resist you. You are Lord. O Lord, God and King, God of Abraham, spare thy people. Look at that beautiful Look at that beautiful language of scripture. God of Abraham, spare thy people, for the eyes of our foes are upon us to annihilate us, and they desire to destroy the inheritance that has been thine from the beginning. Do not neglect thy portion, which thou redeem for thyself out of the land of Egypt. Hear my prayer and have mercy upon your inheritance. Turn our mourning into feasting, that we may live and sing praise to your name. O Lord, do not destroy the mouth of those who praise you. It was mentioned that Afrahat, the Persian, great third century early church father, also utilized the deuterocanonical portion of the book of Esther. And it is indeed true. This is an embarrassing bit of history. What did Afrahat, the Persian, have to say? Mordecai was also persecuted as Jesus was persecuted. Mordecai was persecuted by the wicked Haman, and Jesus was persecuted by the rebellious people. Mordecai, by his prayer, delivered his people from the hands of Haman, and Jesus, by his prayer, delivered his people from the hands of Satan. Mordecai was delivered from the hands of his persecutor, and Jesus was rescued from the hands of his persecutors. Because Mordecai sat and clothed himself with sackcloth, he saved Esther and his people from the sword. And because Jesus clothed himself with a body and was illuminated, he saved the church and his children from death. Do you see the amazing parallels of scripture being drawn by this church father from the third century? Because of Mordecai, Esther was well-pleasing to the king and went in and sat instead of Vashti who did not do his will. And because of Jesus, the church is pleasing, well-pleasing to God and has gone into the king instead of the congregation that did not his will. Mordecai admonished Esther that she should fast with her maidens, that she and her people might be delivered from the hands of Haman. And Jesus admonished the church and its children to fast, that it and its children might be delivered from the wrath. This is a church father that all of the apostolic churches honor as a saint whose feast day is in January. He goes on to say that Mordecai received the honor of Haman, his persecutor, and Jesus received great glory from his father instead of his persecutors who were of the foolish people. Mordecai trod on the neck of Haman, his persecutor, and as for Christ, Jesus, his enemy shall be put under his feet. Before Mordecai, Haman proclaimed, Thus shall it be done to the man in honoring whom the king is pleased. As for Jesus, his preachers came out of the people who persecuted him, and they said, This is Jesus, the Son of God. The blood of Mordecai was required at the hand of Haman and his sons, and the blood of Jesus his persecutors took on themselves and on their children. We cannot emphasize enough that the deuterocanonical version of the book of Esther was the one that the apostolic churches utilized. It was the one canonized as sacred scripture. And we must ask before we conclude this session, which version of Esther are you reading? Does your Bible have the complete one that would have been preached from the pulpit in all of the apostolic churches? 
Or does your Bible have the godless, Esther? We urge you to come to the fullness of the faith. And please pray for us here at the Apocrypha Apocalypse. Like, share, subscribe. Let us know what you thought down below. We'd love to hear your thoughts.